On this Good Friday, we mark time differently. We pause to reflect in a way that causes us to tremble as we hear the familiar words and as we hear that familiar story told over and over again. We find that in our darkest moments, when the nights become the longest, God's presence is there with us, even in the midst of loss and pain, even when we cannot be together and even when we do not know where to go. So this night, this day, we mark differently. We call it Good Friday because it is the day that Christ became human flesh and died once and for all, for every one of us, so that we might believe and have life everlasting. So as you worship with us tonight in song, in prayer, in scripture, be reminded of our own mortality, of our own guilt, of our own shame, but of God's unending love for us, that he would endure death, even death upon a cross. And then wait patiently as you go from faith to faith to the joy that awaits us on the other side. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold us, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, that he who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, may be with us on this holy night. Amen. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go yonder and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, thy will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand.
While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I shall kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Hail, Master, and he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, why are you here? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled.
as they went out, they came upon a man of Cyrene, Simon by the name. This man they compelled to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots, and they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Much of our thinking and reflecting around the life of Christ is exactly that. Hearing the stories and the teachings where Christ is the subject, the object, the thing which captures our desire, which transfix us, instructs us, and gives us hope. But on our readings from the Passion of Christ, on that Good Friday, we read of the scribes, of the priests, of the robbers, of the thieves, of they the unnamed disciple who drew his sword, the unnamed robbers who stood accused and hung for their crime on a cross next to Christ. They mocked him. They derided him. They beat him. All of a sudden, the stories that we've read about Christ's life come to a halt when Christ is no longer the subject. We are. We are the they, we are the scribes, we are the priests, we are the robbers, we are Judas, we are the disciples who fall asleep, we are those who kneel at the cross and weep. We find ourselves fully incapable of the good that we so boldly proclaim to do and desire. And on this Good Friday, this time set apart, we find ourselves in need of someone to save us who is better than we could ever be on our best day, who knew our griefs, who died our death in love, not out of conflict or punishment, not out of some conditional agreement, but in a way that the world would know Christ And know that God would give his only son so that all the world may believe in him. And whoever may believe in him may not perish but have life eternal. On this Good Friday, we become the main actors. We become the players. We become the subject. And we find that when we encounter our own brokenness, we are in need of that Savior who still calls out to us who still calls out to God and who will come again in unexpected ways, in ways that shock and amaze, in ways that cause us to fear and tremble, and in ways that invite us to a deeper relationship. In a moment, we'll hear the readings where Jesus cries out the 22nd Psalm, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we all know what number comes after 22. It's the number 23, the 23rd Psalm. And we are all of a sudden reminded that in spite of our betrayal, in spite of our denial, despite our selfish selves, despite the darkness of our hearts, we have a Savior who invites us to come, to kneel at the cross, and to await the hope of the resurrection.
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lamach shabbatani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calls for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks trembled. And the graves were opened, and the bodies of the saints which slept arose. And they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and those that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. 